our next speaker uh, sort of lives in this building right upstairs here. So I don't think I need to say too much, but I will say at least a little bit of what's possible. Jonathan Arick, who is a longtime friend and a very long time member of the journal, the journal's editorial and lead for what was called the Long Time Founding Collective, is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of English here and the director of the University Humanities Center at Pitt, which is why I pointed directly upstairs. And in fact, I think it's since 1979, right? Boundary 2. Boundary 2 has been part of the Boundary 2 project. So we're we're coming up to 40, 40, 40 years, which uh, makes it among the living possibly the second longest serving member of the United States. Jonathan studied at Harvard. Uh, he was a fellow in the Society of Fellows early in the 1970s. Uh, from there, he moved to Princeton, uh, where I met him through the mediation of a good friend, also formerly a member of the board. Daniel O'Hara. He since then has taught at the University of Illinois Chicago. He was a faculty member at Duke, if I remember the story correctly. He never actually taught a class there. Yeah, I was on leave the year I was on the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> Came to Pitt, left Pitt, he went to Columbia, where he was the chair of the English department long enough to save the Columbia English department from final disappearance. In 2010, he published a book that uh, those of you who are interested, particularly in the novel, should be careful to read, and read it carefully, a book called In, in Fewer Worlds, The Institution of Literature in the Age of the Novel. This follows on 2005, um, his publication as a standalone book, entitled The Emergence of American Literary Narrative, 1820-1860 with Harvard, which had been his core extended contribution to the Zach Van Berkovich edited New American History. Extremely interesting book, very contested in some ways, um, and a book of, I think, Jonathan's career almost as pivotal importance as another I'll mention in a minute. A book called, in quotation marks, Huckleberry Finn, as idol and target the functions of criticism in our time. It's the second half of that topic, titled the subtopic your particular attention to. In 1989, he published Critical Genealogies with Columbia, subtitled Historical Situations for Postmodern Literary Studies. And in 1979, as I recall, uh, the revised thesis commissioned Spirits, The Shaping of Social Motion in Dickens, Carlyle, Melville, and Hawthorne, which was reissued by Columbia uh, a book very much worth looking at for all sorts of reasons, but not least of them being the, the daring to compare the British American situation, a step which may well have moved Jonathan into the discussion of American literature while at the same time denying that he is an Americanist in some ways. Some proof for that is the book in progress called Against Americanistics. <laughs> As you probably all know, he's got several edited volumes, including among the more interesting ones, I think, after Foucault, a volume called The Consequences of Theory, which he co-edited with uh, Barbara Johnson. He did, and since this is Boundary 2 event, I have to mention this as especially interesting, an issue of Boundary 2 with Ronald Judy, uh, R. I. Judy on Ralph Ellison, which was a prospective examination of Ellison, period. Ellison was like 02 or something. So there was in 50 years after the That's year. correct. Forgive me, I didn't make a note of it. But it's interesting to me is that it's it's done with uh, a prospective subtitle, Ralph Ellison, the next the next 50 years. Yeah. And um, here, as I'm sure he'll show you in a minute, but I will show you first, is uh, a recent uh, project come to fruition, uh, working with Colin McCabe and others, John co-edited and updated and ex considerably expanded version of uh, Raymond Williams' famous volume of keywords, called Keywords for Today. He has 100 or so chapters.
large number of distinguished lecturers, presentations, etc. So in order not to use up any more of his time for today, let me just tell you that his title is Ways of Working with Language. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, all of those who are here. It's, it has been so valuable a part of my life for more than 40 years to work with Boundary 2, to have the opportunity once or twice a year to talk to a group of new and old friends, people that I can trust to listen attentively and to argue hard. Uh, and it's a wonderful gift. Boundary 2 mourns our Jewish neighbors murdered October 27 at Tree of Life Synagogue. We urge our audience to join in actions that dispel ignorance, combat hate, and promote the equality of all people. And having made sure I could actually say the words that I wanted to say, I will give you the handout which simply gives the proper names that will appear in my, in my discourse. So two of my major experiences over the last year and a half involve books that are deeply and fundamentally about language. On the one hand, my collaborative work that Paul already uh, has previewed for you in Keywords for Today by the Keywords Project. Colin McCabe and Holly Janacek did the necessary work of backbreaking editing to make sure the manuscript was as it should be. But uh, as a member of the project, I went through twice uh, the, the full body of the manuscript to fact check, basically, every three, stuff like that. It was a lot of work. I think it's a very good thing that we've done. That's, that's one form of working with language, and I'll return to Williams's keywords at the end. The, the other was reading Sheldon Pollock's book, The Language of the Gods in the World of Now. I think it's a really remarkably good book. I hope that this is a room full of people who will help me think critically about it also. But the latter portion of my discourse today is going to be an attempt to state briefly and clearly why I admire it. I want to try to think a little bit first about how do I come to two such different things linked only by language. Our conference title, Does Attention to Language Matter Anymore? Which, in ways that we've already spent time with in the last two days immediately raises the question, to whom and for what? And the first whom in this case is going to be simply me, but with some sense that we've shown that there's a we to that me too. And for what? Well, I'm going to be most interested in what I'll call, for short, criticism. Now, does attention to language matter anymore? Leaving aside our enemies, of whom we've heard something in discussion already and can't forget because they're, they're there, nonetheless, I want to say, among those who might be our friends, there seem to me two significant groups who might be imagined to hold the negative. That is, very broadly, the people who would say not language but image is the crucial thing in our world. And 
I'm sure you'll understand that I simply want to say there's a conversation to have there, which is to say I go back to the side of language. But that's an important position. Interestingly enough, uh, one of the starting points for that line of thought is the 1962 book by the conservative historian Daniel Boorstin, The, the Image, uh, a guide to pseudo-events in America. Um, so there's the image people, and then there are what I would call the mistaken anti-formalists. That is to say, there seem to be some people who believe that attention to language means you think only about language as it's turned in upon itself. Uh, or to put it another way, there are, there are people who I think have a very poor reading of Ilya Pata or text. Uh, so that's setting the large field within, within which this, uh, not defense, but simply account uh, takes place. Speaking about language in the United States today, but yesterday too, language is a problem in the United States because the United States has for a long time been notoriously monolingualist. We all know there are lots of languages spoken by people living in the United States and lots of languages spoken by people who are even American citizens. But the, the force of the English-only ideology is extremely powerful, and I don't think has been very well accounted for yet by, by scholarly studies. I mean, one of the stories involves you know, how the learned practitioners of the word of God in the 17th century who knew Greek and Latin and Hebrew and Aramaic as well as English, how somehow over 200 years plus we got to the point where it has become well established that the word of God can be consulted in the Bible in English. That's really a belief very widely shared, and to really understand it, I think, would be a work that, that hasn't been, been done yet. Speaking for myself, uh, I am, if not a monolingualist, nonetheless somebody who, whose parents, both born as first generation Americans to immigrant parents, both growing up in Yiddish-speaking households. They had no interest that I learn the language that had been the language of, of their childhood, and I don't know it. I think in that context about the meaning of the good old philological requirement that I fulfilled in my doctoral studies, and I'm real glad that I did, uh, where I have some good use of French, German, Greek, and Latin, but in a way that is, again, autobiographically comprehensible. Uh, I now see this as part of my, my 19th century lost heritage. Uh, I wasn't there then, they, they weren't my ancestors, but somehow, you know, somehow I, I, have, I have learned what they, what they wanted me to learn. Now, I think in this regard, too, about the extraordinary transformation in the Supreme Court of the United States within quite recent years, I'm not referring to the right-wing takeover exactly. What I'm referring to is a Supreme Court that has only Catholics and Jews on it. And in particular, the idea of a Catholic majority Supreme Court would have been absolutely incomprehensible any time in American history before my birth anyway. It's not that I'm 
but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, up to 1950, up to 1960. I mean, in 1960, it was considered very remarkable that, that a Catholic could be elected president and there was a lot of it. So, I think, and again, I, I throw this out as something it would be wonderful if somebody actually knew how to do the scholarship to uh, make it real rather than just a crackpot idea. I think that Vatican II was crucial to making Catholics Americans by virtue of taking away Latin as the language of, uh, of ritual. Even though some of the people who have uh, risen to this, this new eminence are people with, with a certain amount of learning beyond the new law, even though the, fa the fact is that take the Latin away and they're, they're, one, of, they're one of the us that, that cares about. A book that I've been writing less than I would have liked, um, partly because I take so much pleasure in the work of the Humanity Center upstairs, is a book on immigrant and cosmopolitan language practices in American fiction over the last century. Time passed more than a century now. But anyway, back to the late 19th century. So, these are a series of reflections about one of the ways that language matters for us here now is the problem of English in the United States. With regard to literary study itself, I don't think digital humanities is a big deal as far as this issue goes. I think that Language is not going to go away because of digital humanities. We, you know, we can talk about that. But it's, certainly I know plenty of people, including some in the room associated with this topic, even if critically associated with it, who of course are uh, skilled and delighted language users. Moreover, despite my own, my own commitment, I recognize that it's possible not merely to be a literary scholar, but to achieve outstanding critical work without close language attention. For example, critics as different as Georg Lukács and Joseph Frank. Uh, Lukács' theory of the novel doesn't quote and analyze passages. Well, of course, a theory shouldn't, should it? But on the other hand, a lot of the theory movement of recent years would have said you couldn't possibly without it. But he doesn't. It's still a book of remarkable power, a scale of 100 years after, after it was written. So you can do it. And then Joseph Frank's five-volume great work on Dostoevsky's novels in their cultural context within his life. Frank is somebody who had all the appropriate skills for the kind of reading that would focus closely on language, but he just didn't do it. Uh, I, I don't, there are moments where a particular Russian term is highlighted out of the discourse of the moment given a bit of attention, but I don't think there's any place where any consequential claim about any of the novels you know, hinges on attention to, to a word or to a syntactic pattern. Uh, that's okay. There, there are other things to do, and uh, he does them extraordinarily well. Thinking about my own particular path, um, 
Although I happened to begin my serious education at age 12 in 1957, the year of Sputnik, I attended a school where first Latin, then French, then Greek were first two requirements, the last an opportunity that, that, I, that I pursued. My parents did not force me to love physics more than I did. I didn't hate it, I just loved the other things. Uh, in my first year at university, where, as I've written recently in other contexts, uh, were forthcoming in Boundary 2, um, where my reading, for example, of um, Moby Dick and Walden both were um, great experiences in my life, having been so lucky not to have to read those works in high school because I really did not have a good English teacher in high school. And, but but the, 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 the memorable aspect of my first year in college with regard to language questions involves a wonderful translation project. Um, the poet and translator John Frederick Nims gave a seminar on lyric poetry in which the major text of reference was the anthology edited by Stanley Burnshaw that Nims had been one of the associate editors of called The Poem Itself. That, that volume of about 150 poems in French, uh, German, Italian, Spanish, and one or two in Russian, uh, that volume of about 150 poems from roughly Baudelaire to uh, the mid 20th century, where each poem appears in its original language and then is translated over a roughly two page running commentary. Uh, it, was, it was a, a wonderful experience. Uh, So, although I have not, unlike many of the others of you, uh, I have not practiced translation. One of, one of my formative advanced or advancing literary experiences involved uh, this kind of work with translation. As, as, a, as a second year student, I, I think I thought I was going to major in history, but I found, I, I found the character intellectual leadership offered by a sophomore tutor instructing a small group in historiography. I, f I found it very uninspiring. Um, I, I broke with it over, I mean, give the guy credit, do I remember his name now? Give the guy credit, he had us read Eichmann in Jerusalem, which had just come out. He recognized that this brand new controversial work was apropos for students beginning the study of history and thinking about what it means to write history. But he had such a poor idea of, of what the stakes of the book were that, that I, I, I couldn't respect it. I mean, as a young person, you make choices and live with the consequences of them. I don't wish I was a historian. I think in some sense I was right, but it was an unfair judgment. <laughs> uh, so in my, in my second year, I, I read on my own because reading of literary criticism was not something that an undergraduate English major at Harvard in those days was expected to do, instructed in do, required no, nothing. So I read what turned out to be excellent, but in a sense, random works. Uh, Leslie Fiedler's Love and Death in the American Novel. Uh, Northrop Frye's Anatomy of Criticism. Kenneth Burke's uh, Philosophy of Literary Form. The Fiedler 
I got, I think, because I remembered reading the New York Times review of it, as they said it was a brilliant, crazy book. Well, sounds good. Uh, the Fry was absolutely because my roommate, Stuart Davis, was a much more ambitious and educated student of literature than I was. And he said, you've got to read this. And the Kenneth Burke, it was around the house. Um, my, my parents were not intellectuals or scholars, but my father in particular was sympathetic to scholarship, the life of the mind. And my parents had been uh, broadly in the New York City popular front clientele of the 1930s. As I eventually discovered as a scholar, Kenneth Burke had been. So Kenneth uh, Burke was not based in New York at that point, but, uh, but close, closely. So Fiedler, still a book I'm glad I read, but not much to do with language, plot, character, theme. Those are, those are all things he has a lot to say about. Fry, very interesting. One of the four essays in Anatomy of Criticism, Theory of the Symbol, is in fact the excerpt that Hazard Adams uses in his criticism anthology, because uh, Adams uh, cared about poetry as a scholastic. I just didn't get that part of Fry at all. Uh, it was the, the essays on mode, myth, and genre, the ones that in a sense chimed with, uh, with Fiedler that, uh, that I got from it. It was eventually I have read with considerable interest of Fry's theory of the essay on the symbol. But it's not actually part of my formation. Whereas uh, Burke's responsiveness to Joycean wordplay in relation to Freudian language analysis combined with his concern for writing as rhetoric, that is to say, as trying to do something, sometimes for yourself, but sometimes too for other people, uh, made, it, made an impact on me. I'll just touch a couple one of the word places in Burke. Some of you know what, had, what became for a while, in later years, 50 years later, a famous essay of his called Political Symbolism in American Writing, which he gave at one of the uh, communist sponsored American Writers Conferences. I think it was the 1936 one. And he proposed, if we really want to appeal to Americans at large, we have to drop this word worker because that doesn't hit anybody where they live, except in a very unpleasant place where they live, and use the word people. Now, you know, on a large political map, this was premature popular frontism <coughs> on, on his part. But uh, as it's a tiny little essay, very pregnant, and uh, as an example of thinking about words in a very active context, it's striking. He also um, wrote an essay that some of you may know called The Rhetoric of Hitler's Battle, which is a rhetorical reading of Mein Kampf, which had recently started to circulate in English. Now, Burke, in fact, knew German well. He was an early translator of Thomas Mann. He was reading Freud and Nietzsche in, in German, as well as in the translations that were appearing. But this, this, this is a reading that is a, an, an important rhetorical reading, but not one that, that's language-oriented. In that sense, it's sort of like Frank on, on, on Dostoevsky. But the, the crucial thing about that essay which is one of the germs of cultural studies as a practice, is 
precisely this respect in which it is like so much of what's best as well as sometimes dubious in cultural studies, that is to say, turning learned scholarly attention to works that in some sense you think are trash, but that you believe are having tremendously powerful effects. And very importantly, what Burke did was not try to show how bad Hitler was, that, that goes without saying for the audience he was attending, but rather to try to figure out what made the work so powerful and what could we learn from it that we could write powerfully ourselves. Okay, so that's that cluster of, bo of books of Fiedler, Frey, and Berg was what determined me this thing that was then called literary criticism, and I don't give the word up even though nobody uses it anymore. Uh, this thing called literary criticism could be something you could use your whole life for. And I liked that. So it turns out I'm not going to say much about new criticism, which is funny, but there, there it is. The, here is Cleanne Brooks's The Well Wrought Urn, which is the book that I think did most to identify new criticism with integral readings of whole short poems, which innumerable people did both in books and in essays for decades afterwards. But it was it was by you know by no means the norm for new criticism to do that. But that's a whole a whole other conversation we can have. The, the critic scholar associated with new criticism with whom I studied, Reuben Brower, famously also the leader of the course in which Paul Deman learned close reading as a teacher. Uh, Reuben Brower had done his PhD at Harvard in the 1930s in classical philology, his uh, dissertation had been a study of John Dryden's late 17th century translations of Virgil. Uh, and the course of his that I took, which was a, a memorable course and led to a very good book, uh, was a course on Shakespeare and the Greco-Roman uh, heroic tradition. And the the interest of that course was in showing not just the, the rootedness of words. It wasn't a word that, no, there were words, but it wasn't, it wasn't a philological IE type, uh, type attention to words. It was really words within discursive structures and figurations where you recognize a certain verbal pattern in Shakespeare and see on the one hand classical prototypes for it in the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid and others too, and also look at the mediation through Elizabethan translations uh, by which these verbal forms became available for Shakespeare's uh, reading and work. I think that what I have ended up with, however, as the area of language, doing, you know, working, working with language questions that particularly interest me, is what I call language as the site of social conflict. And on the one hand, at the level of discourse, Bakhtin is very associated with that now. Um, I will remind you, as you don't need reminding, of a few highlights of this topic, language as the site of social conflict over the ages. In the Hebrew Bible, the Shibboleth, 42,000 Ephraimites slaughtered because they couldn't say the word right. In Shakespeare's Tempest, Taliban says to Prospero, you know, I taught you how to talk. Oh, curse now. Or in portrait of the artist as a young man, Stephen Dedalus is thinking about the headmaster. He calls this a funnel? It's a tongue dish. Uh, 
Stephen later learns, as the OED will tell us, that you know, Tundish, although an Irishism to the English and my own language to Stephen, Tundish is just as English, if not more, than Funnel. Uh, it's, it's got nothing of the Gaelic in it. Uh, or uh, Ngugi's decision to, at a certain point, stop writing in the English that he had, like Caliban, learned, and instead to do his original composition in Kukui. However, for the purposes of today's talk, uh, Raymond Williams's keywords is one of the places where I learned this uh, approach to thinking about language as the social source of social as the site of social conflict. Following on a reading of William, or an earlier reading of Williams's Culture and Society, which is somebody turning towards 19th century British studies, so was uh, a huge inspiration. And I'm sure most of you know that Williams begins the book with calling out several what he calls already then key words, industry, democracy, class, art, culture. And the point that he's making is that these words with a long history in English and fully recognizable to us now as part of our everyday language usage went through dramatic transformations in their meaning around 1800 in relation to the things that we call the political and the industrial revolutions of the moment. I think there's no doubt that Williams going on to read through a body of important British non-fictional, primarily non-fictional prose, literature, ideas, and polemic of the 19th and earlier 20th century, looking at the way these words and some of their close cousins operated in these texts, this kind of language attention helped prepare me 10 or 15 years later to be interested in what Derrida was doing with Supplement in the Dramatologie or, or with uh, Pharmacon in the Francie de Platon. So uh, who, who would have thought that Raymond Williams would, would ease my path to, uh, to Derrida, but so, so it was. And I'll just conclude this portion before turning to uh, more about Sheldon Pollock by saying that, that for me, among its important dimensions in Auerbach's mimesis, the question of language as a site of social conflict is very important. That is to say, what a representation of reality, but what Auerbach means by the kind of representation that he is concerned with is first of all a stylistic set of practices that break a socially based classical hierarchy of styles and that have the effect of making it possible to give serious consideration to forms of experience and, and modes of human existence that he argues persuasively, I think, would not have been available earlier, would have been available only for comedy earlier. And he's quite, he's, he's quite exigent in uh, his uh, use of this criterion. So for example, you know, the British 19th century novel is too closely allied with comedy to, to suit him. In the case of Germany, of course, he can't avoid facing up to the fact that, from his perspective, it had been the failure of the great moment of the German literary emergence around 1800 that it failed to achieve an appropriate realistic form. So, so I, I see Mimesis within that perspective and 
certainly the chapter on Zola, I think, under, underwrites strongly this way of you know, that I'm thinking about. It. Of course, there's more to our life. So now let me uh, conclude by saying some things about Sheldon Pollock's uh, language of the gods in the world of men from the point of view of an inexpert reader. The language of the gods in the world of men, Sanskrit culture and power in pre-modern India. Ballpark a thousand years from the early common era to a thousand years later than that. He earns so fat a book by achieving the literary historical study of the highest ambition and execution. It means a lot to me that he's written the book with high lucidity, sharing his profound scholarship and technical philological expertise with what in this context I'll characterize as myself a general reader. That is, I don't know Sanskrit, I don't know Indian philology. He has findings to change the shape of his own field of expertise, but as I read the book, he most wants his results to reach more widely, and he's written a book that has the possibility of doing that. Part of why I'm giving this presentation is to say, if, you know, if it lies outside your expertise and it looks too long to read, try it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the narrative is exciting. After centuries as a language used exclusively within religious practice, Sanskrit drastically changes to become a language of literature, and soon thereafter, its literary resources serve to proclaim the grandeur of kings. For hundreds of years more, this regal poetic complex, a union of culture and power, expands geographically not only across India, but also great distances into Southeast Asia, including modern Thailand, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and of course, Java. This expansion came not through conquest, but through cultural adaptation. Sanskrit seemed the perfect vehicle for certain important uses by people in different places and polities. So that's sub-story one. Substory so two, another huge change. Literature began in vernacular languages, which had already for centuries been used as a form of writing for many everyday purposes. Just as had happened in Sanskrit, power and culture came together in the vernacular. Contrary to many ideologies of vernacularity, this emergence of vernacular literature did not come from below, but rather from elite sectors wholly steeped in Sanskrit knowledge and techniques, but now turning those skills to a new purpose in a new language, a deliberately, this term, place-based language, in contrast to the cosmopolitan, in principle, universal plane of Sanskrit. So I've just given you, in 250 words, the the narrative of about 400 pages of his book. He doesn't just make the case in detail. He made me care about the details. The book is long, but not over lengthy. I would not have expected to find English versions of 2,000-year-old Sanskrit royal pillar inscriptions poetically powerful. I would have been willing to take his word for it to see what he did with it, but but actually he brings the force and beauty, if not the actual sound harmonies, into English. Now, back 40 years ago when I read Orientalism, Edward Said's fundamental argument won my assent. Said asserted that Orientalist discourse was a closed system, more the product of a knowledge power system of domination than a means of understanding actual human activities in another And I believed his assertion, although ignorant about the that, so, because I had tried at various times to read what I had been told were valuable works about the Middle East, and had found that because of their presuppositions, I didn't think I was learning anything I could believe. By contrast, 
that is to the Orientalists, Pollock makes his historical account and its actors credible to me. They're not just like me, they're really different. But the constellation of action and achievement that he demonstrates over a thousand years across many miles in various languages makes sense. Even though Sanskrit poetics, even in its vernacular variants, is the least demotic imaginable, Pollock persuades me that he's a human being writing about human beings. Therefore, I'm in a position to be compelled by the extensions from his primary materials that he makes in three stages. First, he proposes that the Sanskrit cosmopolis, as he calls it, of culture and power with a claim to universality seems highly comparable to the roughly contemporaneous case of Rome and Latin. Some will remember in the Aeneid, Jupiter promises Rome empire without end, imperium sine fine dei. Pollock underlines what seems to him the major differences, that is comparison, difference. There was no Indian political unit corresponding to the Roman Empire under one single ruler. Sanskrit auto panegyric spread from king to king across independent polities. And Sanskrit coexisted as an elite language with diverse languages of everyday life, which eventually took on their own politics, by contrast to the process through which Latin overrode and eventually eliminated local languages throughout Europe. Uh, I, sh I should add that it's consequential for the overall structure of things that uh, Pollock particularly focuses on the, the vernacular phase of his argument on the non-Sanskritic, non-Indo-European, South Indian languages, Kannada, which is his main case, and uh, Telugu and uh, Tamil. Now, it's not because I'm ungrateful that I ask for more. Uh, that is, it seems to me that if you're, if you're going to look at what he looks at, you might have thought about the spread of Greek precipitated by Alexander's conquest, the spread of Arabic after the revelation to the prophet, later on the uh, Persian. But, you know, it's, it's good that even I, who don't know anything, am made to think these thoughts. So extension two compares the Indian vernacular experience to the European vernacular revolution, again, roughly contemporaneous. His largest point I wholly share, namely, the West needs far more serious research on European languages and what it still makes some sense to call the Dark Ages because we've cast so little light on them. And his further point wins my assent too, namely in Europe as in India and Sanskrit, the establishment of vernacular literature came in many cases from writers already expert in Latin, that is, as, as in Sanskrit and in India. The major difference that he seeks to develop is very suggestive and not very flattering to Europe. Namely, that the rhetoric of European vernacular identification in ways that we are all familiar with became biologized, understood in terms of race or blood, quite unlike what he sees as the forms of geographically place-based identification in Indian vernaculars. And part of my sympathy with this argument on his part I can't say whether he's correct on the Indian side, but in my own work for the 1997 Huckleberry Finn as Idol and Target, I found somewhat to my shock that even in broadly leftist uh, Jewish American uh, scholars, American vernacular theory turned out to be inadvertently, probably, racist and nativist. The overall vernacular topic, of course, requires further development across subfields of literature and history. The way Pollock uses the term, especially its derivative vernacularization, is not only different from the uh, American usage, 
but also from the way the term functions in 19th century colonial discourses and in some important recent work concerning colonialism, work by both Annette and Amory uh, brought into that conversation. Pollock's third extension opens to modern discourses of social theory, modern as of from the 19th century on, and post-colonialism, sort of Marx, Weber, and post-colonialism is the short of it, as well as to current Indian history at the time he was writing, about 15 years ago. A context, the Indian context, that's become yet more widely important as various forms of nativism and Populism arise across the world's polities. Pollock's arguments concerning religious issues of Sanskrit and vernacular cut broadly in a secular direction, and combined with his critique of passionate vernacularism, the European model, add up to a large critique of contemporary Hindu nationalist premises, as he states. I'm sure more controversial in the world of scholarship, he argues that his evidence cuts against many forms of determinism, determinism from Marxism on up, which provide our go-to frames for large-scale thought about historical change. He certainly doesn't hold that people are at all times free to do whatever they want, but he develops strong cases against the overriding force attributed to language and to culture in a wide range of current multiculturalisms. And some of that topic area emerged in, in David's talk yesterday. I want to close with, uh, I apologize for taking my time. I won't read it. Uh, I'll just close by saying he makes an extremely important critique of a, of a very prestigious form of current intellectual history, broadly the Cambridge School of Political Theory. He, he quotes a telling and typical passage from Clinton Skinner, where Skinner speaks on behalf of seeing what they thought then, not having any idea whether you think it's better or worse. Uh, and Pollock says, the only reason you're going to go to the trouble to write a history like his or like theirs is because you care about these things and you do better to say what you care about rather than pretending you don't. And he says that better, but to the same effect. Uh, you can't find it in the index. It's on page 570. <laughs> <laughs> the name Quentin Skinner doesn't appear in the index. And that's the only mention in the book. It's a very important one. So that's, that's done. All right, thank you. Thank you.